So up here this evening, um, we have obviously Rachel and Robin, our amazing directors. Let's give them a hand. Both of them are award-winning filmmakers, and you can see, uh, learn about their other films here on the bios on the program, and make sure to check those out. Um, after that, we have Michael Belt. You might have seen him in the film. He was one of the brave souls that uh, helped occupy the building, the workplace. He moved to Western Mass, so we have his energy here now. Next to him is Jonah. Um, Jonah works at Hampshire College Food Dining Services and was instrumental in helping to organize the workers there with Unite Here New England Joint Board. Um, then next we have John McGee, who works um, with the Agrarian Action Network and also the Pioneer Valley Worker Center with farm workers and allies to help figure out how to raise standards for um, farm workers across Western Massachusetts. <laughs> He's a new addition, so you won't see him on the list, but he'll tell you more about himself. Um, and then we have Jonathan Alvarez, who is... Woo, <laughs> He is a local restaurant worker, a fantastic soccer player, and active with the Pioneer Valley Workers Center. And we have uh, David Gowler, who is a steward at the River Valley Market with their union there, United Food and Commercial Workers, Local 1459. And was instrumental in starting the co-op and also in helping to form the union there. So, um, there you go. Um, so, should we, I'm wondering if we should just open it right up for questions or let you folks say a little bit about, you know, what you've done and then we'll switch quickly. We'll just give them like one minute each, how about, um, to say a few words and they'll pass it down and talk a little bit about their struggle to organize and, and that. <laughs> Okay. okay, all right. So we'll start with Michael then. Um, you're starting, you're lucky one. Um, he's going to tell us a little bit about why he got involved with the hot and crusty struggle and maybe give us some insights um, as a community on how we might think about helping to support other workers locally or nationally um, in their struggles. Thanks, Rose. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for, for coming out this evening and enjoying the great film. And thanks again to Rob and Rachel tireless uh, work putting the film together and did a wonderful job. So um, I wanted to quickly talk about um, my role with the campaign. I think as it showed in the film, I was a, a community activist. I was active with Occupy Wall Street. And the Lodger Worker Center came to Occupy Wall Street with a real clear vision and a real clear strategy to win. And they were able to present a, a platform and a strategy that was, was bulletproof. So we were all happy at that point to support, through whatever means that we could, their organizing. And I think it showed, Robin and Rachel did a great job of showing in the film that the actual strategy was executed by the workers. And that's where the power really came from. And so I'm, I'm excited to be here in the Pioneer Valley Workers Center, especially, uh, sorry, Pioneer Valley, especially with the Pioneer Valley Workers Center starting and being in such an um, initial phase of, of beginning. And I think, as uh, Hector said this evening, one of the best ways for, for us to be involved is to find that envelope and uh, donate. So no campaigns, I want to say, are executed without time and resources. And that really, um, you know, without those things, workers, it's much more difficult to organize. So I think that's all I'll say in that front. All right, next we'll have Jonah talk a little bit about how he organized his union and, um, and yeah. Thanks, Rose. Um, well, first I just wanted to say this is my second time seeing the movie, and thank you both so much for making it. Um, I think it's just a really important and, for me personally, really powerful movie to see, so thank you. Um, yeah, so I, quickly, I worked, I worked at Hampshire College as a cook. I worked there for a year with no union, and then me and my coworkers decided to organize a union, and have now been there about one school year with a union contract. Um, and one thing that just has gone through my mind watching this movie is, like, generally how really stressful and 
unpredictable it is to work in this industry. Like I'm, thankfully we, w I didn't work for a company that was trying to shut its doors and lay off the entire workforce. But I was there at Hampshire College when one company came in, another one left, and just every day walked into work not really knowing what I was walking into. You know, we were working with equipment that's falling apart while we're using it. We have managers who are coming in long enough to get trained and are just moving on. And I think something that's really easy to lose among all that is the sense that like my voice actually matters. And I think you're able to see that. Like it was incredible to me how much bravery it took the workers in this movie, or at Hot and Crusty, to actually say in the face of this company sh shutting its doors and all of us losing our jobs, like I still, my voice still really matters. And I think to me like that is really, that's something that is just very easy to lose in the midst of this really chaotic and hectic industry that we work in is that 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 like that what I have that the issues that I have as a worker and that the issues that they have had as workers um, still like are relevant and deserve to be heard um, and and I think that it. I think to me like the most important thing that we really did at Hampshire and organizing union was not so much what we were able to win as far as like healthcare, affordable healthcare, which is really unheard of in this industry and like wages that you can raise a family on. I think the most important thing to me that actually happened was people up, up against these corporations that are really there, there to make a profit actually said like a lot of them for the first times in their lives this actually isn't good enough for me like my voice does have, does deserve to be heard and and I'm actually going to like a lot of people for the first time say no say that this we actually deserve better than what we're getting and almost regardless of what we're actually able to win I think just the act of saying no I deserve better was something that was really revolutionary and that this film really captured. Like you could see, I, at least I could, the progression of whom, how MoMA changed as a person because of that decision to say like, I deserve better than what I'm getting. Um, and that's something that just your film has had me thinking about and that I'm really grateful that I was able to re relive. So I just checked in with the Hugh, our technical um, assistant here from the Academy, and so we're okay to go over a few minutes. So, you know, I had said like a minute, but you can speak a little bit more. And if, if you all in the audience have places you need to go, feel free to leave, but we hope you do stay. Um, so next we're gonna hear from um, John McGee, a little bit about the Agrarian Action Network and the Agricultural Justice Project. Hi, so my name is John McGee. I'm with the Agrarian Action Network. And we've been collaborating with the Workers' Center for about a year, a little over a year. Uh, we basically met uh, Rose and Claire last spring. Um, and we met over a discussion about um, a fair trade standard called the Agricultural Justice Project. Well, it's called Food Justice Certification developed by the Agricultural Justice Project. Basically, um, you know, the folks that, that are in my group we have come together because we feel like when all the excitement about uh, sustainable agriculture, local agriculture, um, food and farming in the valley, um, throughout all of that, you know, really, you know, positive, happy feeling, there's just very little recognition of um, who does a lot of the work, and that is, that is the workers, many of whom live a very precarious existence. Um, and so we're, we're promoting this fair trade standard just as a way to sort of open up a conversation about what it's like to work on farms and what it could be like to work on farms um, if, we really, if we really came together as a community and said, this is, this is how we value labor, this is how we value the people who, who raise our food, and, uh, and we're going to make it happen. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Okay. <laughs> 
So again, this is Jonathan, and he's a local restaurant worker. He's going to talk to us about um, his work and his participation with the Worker Center, and um, Hector's going to translate. Yeah? Okay. Buenas noches a todos. Este, uh, mi nombre es Jonathan. Uh, uh, mi relación con, los, con el trabajo con ellos es como, uh, como el visor de los trabajadores, este, a los que tienen miedo a hablar o, o expresar sus frustra su frustraciones en el trabajo. Uh, en esta vez no puedo uh, hablarlo en inglés, pero aquí él, él les va a ir traduciendo. So I'm here tonight to, to share with you my experiences with wor working uh, at a local restaurant and, and uh, giving voice to those that don't speak up. And Hector will be here to translate. Uh, I will not for tonight. Si alguna de las personas que están aquí este, tiene una pregunta específica que me quieran hacer acerca de, de los trabajadores uh, de Northampton, ¿no? de cualquier uh, parte uh, que sea relacionada uh, a los restaurantes, este, pueden hacérmelo sin ninguna duda. So if anybody in the audience has a specific question in relation to um, what it's like to work in here in Northampton, uh, feel free to um, uh, ask it. Muchas de las personas que estamos aquí este, uh, no se sabe el trabajo que se realiza este, atrás de los restaurantes o las cosas específicas que pasan algunos de los trabajadores este, uh, queremos como implementar este, um, o hacerle ver a los trabajadores sus reglas y derechos que, que tienen um, para que ellos puedan seguir este, uh, trabajando confiablemente so, so a, lot, a lot of people that are here tonight don't know what it's like to work at a restaurant and all, all the things that happen in a restaurant are specific things. Um, so we work, we work to make sure that people know their rights and, 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 and the rules that are there to protect them. Um, queremos este, que las cosas uh, cambien uh, para mejor, no para peor. Um, queremos este, transmitirle esa seguridad a los trabajadores uh, que tienen el miedo a hablar o a expresar uh, sus historias malas uh, porque la mayoría este, no, no está de acuerdo um, a hablar o redactar su historia a miedo que lo corran de su, de su trabajo. So we, we want to make sure to change things for the better, not for the worse. Not for the worse, for the workers. Some people don't feel safe in the workplaces. We want to we make sure that that, that changes. Eso es todo lo que tengo por hablar por uh, ahora. Uh, si tienen una pregunta, uh, pues pueden hacerla. That's all I have for now. If you have any questions, please feel, feel free to ask it. Um, all right, I'm going to pass the mic to you to tell us about uh, the River Valley Market and organizing your union there. I wanted to first thank all of you for being here and to really thank uh, Rachel and Robin for this, that movie. Was that a beautiful movie? Huh? And uh, uh, gracias a uh, Mohamed Lopez uh, y su uh, compañeros uh, uh, Hot and Crusty. Um, I want you to know, and many of you probably already know, that if you work without a union, you work at will. And you can be fired for any reason. So if you work at a place right now and you do not have a union, I strongly encourage you to begin organizing your workplace. Um, many people were, I work at a cooperative, the River Valley Market here in Northampton. And many people were uh, surprised initially about our organizing efforts. You know, you work at a cooperative. Why do you need to bring in a union? You know, why do you need to organize? 
Uh, and it's important to understand that wherever there is a hierarchical management structure in a workplace, there is the potential for abuse and lack of respect for workers. So we had to organize to, uh, to get the respect uh, that we deserve as workers and to have a, an equal place at the table and to have an opportunity to uh, increase our wages and benefits. And we're continuing with that struggle as we prepare to uh, negotiate our second contract. So uh, I want you to know also that uh, retail food cooperatives are, are currently under attack from corporate influence from the national organizations and National Cooperative Grocers, formerly National Cooperative Grocers Association, from their consulting arm, the Cooperative Development Services. Managers go to be trained at the uh, Consumer Cooperative Management Association trainings where they are further indoctrinated into corporate mentality. So, you know, if you're a member of a cooperative, you need to really as a member, claim your power and work with, ask the board for a meeting, a series of meetings with the workers, with all of the members, and with management to really sit down and figure out what the direction of the cooperative is because there's some work that needs to be done. Um, thank you to all our panelists, and now um, you all have an opportunity to ask any questions to the filmmakers and to the rest of the panel. You can either come up to this mic and make sure you speak directly into it, or if you still wanted to hand in a card, you can hand it to me. I'll be up here. We have someone ready to ask. Go ahead. Debo hacer la pregunta bilingüe, pero por tiempo pido esto que traduzca para el compañero a su lado. It's a great film. I love it. It's also a great organizing tool. So I have the following question, which I know is a question about money. I have quite a few friends in the food industry, restaurants specifically, who um, wouldn't be able to appreciate this film because it's not a bilingual film. Is there any chance under the sun for the sake of organizing and for um, giving them their due and respect and future that you will find a way to make the film bilingual? Yes, that's an easy question. Um, we have a DVD that just got printed um, that is bilingual and has full Spanish and English subtitle options as well as closed captioning for the hearing impaired. So that will, that's absolutely available as an organizing tool starting now. Um, unfortunately, the Blu-ray that we played tonight was only in English because it was an early edition and we didn't have time to, to give the options. But um, we actually did plan to try to do a bilingual screening even tonight. So we're very um, interested in that. Thank you. say it was just a very inspiring film. I just want to say it was a very inspiring film and it was just a wonderful production and it's so great what you're doing. Uh, I'm a representative of Valley Free Radio in the Valley here. And I just want you to know all of you here representing these causes that we are the spokesperson for you. Please keep that in mind. And in a time where we live, where media is controlled by big business and corporate concerns and lobbyists, we are a vehicle still of freedom of speech. So any activities, any things that you're doing, we would love to know about. Call the station. You can go on a show. 
we'll put you on the air, but we'll also transcribe and speak to people in the valley about exactly what you're doing, how you're rallying, whatever there might be, a demonstration. I attended the Walmart demonstration in Hadley. So did uh, Pucky Whalen from our organization and quite a few other people. But the most important point I'm trying to get across is you do have a spokesperson here in the Valley. Remember that we are on your side and we support jobs. We justice arise in Springfield and lots of groups similar to all of yourselves as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's a perfect time to actually thank Kaki, who had us and the filmmakers on her show, Bread and Roses, and also Occupy the Airwaves, and leading up to tonight's uh, event. And thank you for her for filming, also. Hi, thanks to all of you for being on the panel. I have a question about the um, specifics of the story we just saw in the film. Uh, the workers were threatened with deportation, and I was curious, that wasn't mentioned other than as a threat, um, how that was avoided. Yeah, so early on when they first spoke with their manager, um, that was his response. Um, but to our knowledge and to the workers' knowledge, um, they the management never went through with that threat. And I think what happened was that the workers actually, after they began to organize and they went through extensive training with the laundry center, laundry worker center about what their rights were, they were able to kind of present a unified front and and really make clear that they knew that any retaliation against them for uh, for their organizing activity was illegal. Um, they made it clear that they were working with lawyers and that they had that type of legal support. So I think that the management backed down in that instance. But it is, that's a threat that, you know, exists in, in all of these types of situations and, you know, getting past the, the fear of that is part of the process of, of organizing for sure. I would add that if we want to support better jobs um, in this country, one thing that we should also support is immigration reform. The two are very connected. algo de, de Jonathan sobre su experiencia como trabajador aquí y también por lo general de las luchas locales que, que tenemos aquí en el Valle. Um, en, en lo personal tengo muchas um, experiencias trabajando en restaurante. Uh, tengo tres años viviendo acá y uh, solamente he trabajado en restaurante y no solamente yo tengo experiencia, también mis otros amigos han pasado mucha experiencia. Personally, I have a lot of experience working in restaurants. I've been, I've been in the area for about three years, and the whole time I have worked in restaurants. And not just me, but a lot of my workers also work in restaurants. A lot of my friends. Uh, cuando re recién venido aquí este, a Northampton, uh, Empecé a trabajar en un restaurante este, donde o sea, el trato que me daban no era, para mi forma de ver, no era un trato este, normal, no era un trato con respeto. Había este, cosas que a mi forma de ver no tienen que ser así de parte de un, de un encargado o, o un dueño de un restaurante. So one of my first jobs here in Northampton, uh, I experienced. Uh, I was treated with disrespect by one of the one of the one of the managers, and that's my experience. It's, it's something that you know that you shouldn't have to go through, but um, I had to uh, experience. Um, en mi primer trabajo tuve muchas experiencias uh, donde me gritaban. Uh, Obviamente por el inglés no, uh, yo no entendía, no sabía qué era, pero este, uno sabe cuando uh, están diciendo, te dicen algo bueno o cuando es algo malo. Uh, 
y obviamente uno se siente frustrado por todo eso. So what, in, the, in the particular job I was treated with uh, disrespect, I was I, I used to get yelled at, and um, and you, you, and it, the language barrier was an issue. I didn't understand what they were saying to me, but but I could tell that it wasn't good just because of the the tone and the, the disrespect was was noticeable. Me gustaría compartir. Uh, uh, todas las experiencias que tengo uh, trabajando en, re en restaurantes y las que he visto de, de mis otros compañeros uh, pero creo que tal vez uh, no sea como un momento uh, adecuado uh, el tiempo no es, no es suficiente ¿entiende? pero uh, tal vez en otra ocasión yo pudiera compartirles uh, una de mis experiencias que he tenido I, I would be happy to share more stories uh, personal stories, but also stories of uh, friends of mine, but because of um, time constraints, uh, we won't be able to do that tonight, but I'd be, I'd be more than happy to do that um, in the future. Hi, uh, thank you. This is a very beautiful film. Uh, if I had to choose two films about uh, the New York working class, I would choose your film and this uh, film uh, La Ciudad by David Ricker. Now, I do have a critical comment. Um, I guess you are going to agree with me, but give me your opinion, which is about the, mm, the international dimension of all these problems. You can see in the movie how the owners of the company, what they decide to do once the uh, workers are actually winning is just to shut down the factory, right? Well, that's exactly what the big corporations do, right? That's exactly the reason for which the United States now has uh, this, as someone was saying, that is the future of the United States economy because the workers were paid a lot in this country, so they moved to, I don't know, Indonesia or Mexico, Honduras or whatever, right? So I, I would just comment that it's kind of absolutely important to mention how the problems of the United States cannot be solved without also addressing the problems of all the other countries in the world, literally, like that. Absolutely. That's a very important point. And also, you know, the United States policies are responsible for the conditions in other countries that lead people to migrate here in the first place. Um, I think one of the, the reasons that uh, a, a store like this is able to succeed even after a, the, the store closes is because it's a service industry, so you can't export the service industry to another country, actually. You're going to need people to be serving sandwiches at delis in New York City. Um, that particular type of job can't be sent to another country. So the store may close, but the owners were motivated to, um, to find new owners to reopen it because they knew it was a profitable location. So um, it's, it's very important uh, to keep in mind all of those elements of globalization as well as to, um, to think about the strategies that can be used in different sectors here as well. Uh, Daniel from uh, Pioneer Valley Local First. We work to encourage people to bank locally, shop locally, eat locally, uh, things like that. And I just wanted to say that your movie is a great example of um, the Albert Einstein Foundation, of the work of uh, Gene Sharp, and how he encourages aggressive nonviolence. Um, I think that you know they were definitely you know, they took that stance throughout the whole struggle there, and really kind of proved it could win. Um, as you know, folks work in the area to make. Uh, restaurants, other businesses, to be more socially responsible, uh, one thing that I would encourage all of us is to develop relationships with the owners of where we shop. Because um, the more that you shop at local businesses, and the more you have a relationship with the owner, with the managers, that when you go to them and you would say, I would like your workers you know, to get better working conditions or get better pay, that A, they see you in their business and B, they have a relationship with you. They know you more than just you know, some stranger that happens to you know, go into their store. But to really you know, develop the relationships, to shop at the places here in the Western Mass that are owned by people that live here in Western Mass, and develop relationships with those folks. Uh, Judy Wicks, who uh, used to own the, uh, the restaurant, uh, the White Dog Cafe, she's in a great uh, book called Americans Who Tell the Truth. And she said a lot of people think that business is about money. 
And it really isn't. Um, it's really about having strong relationships with every stakeholder, you know, your customers, your investors, your employees, the world, you know, the environment, etc. And if you have those strong relationships, then chances are you'll have a good business. So that would just be my comment, but definitely thank you, Robin and Rachel, for a wonderful film. Thank you, thank you. yeah, I would add to that. Um, you're absolutely right about uh, having a relationship with the business owners and the places you frequent is actually um, advice that was given to us when we asked Mahoma what he would recommend to customers um, who cared about these issues, and he said, talk to the managers, but also talk to the workers, because um, ask, asking the people who are serving you how they're treated is a really good way to find out um, you know, if this is the kind of place you want to support, but then rather than taking your money away if they're treated badly, the best thing to do may be to go to the manager and tell them that you know what's going on and that you don't approve and that you'd like it to change. I love the film and clearly everybody here loved it. I don't know how many people you converted from black to white, but I'm wondering what your hope or your plan is to show this to people who really need to have their eyes opened on the issues versus people who agree with it and were entertained. That's, that's a really good question and, and a slightly tricky one. I mean, I think that um, there's a, there's a uh, rather than black to white, I'd like to think of it as maybe a gray scale or a ladder of engagement. You know, people are, our, we know that it, at, at screen, we've done a few uh, surveys at, at festival screenings and such about, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that the film will help people go from maybe caring about an issue to being a little more willing to get involved. And so even if it isn't a, a total change of mind from complete opposition, um, that, that that type of change is something that, that we hope the film can accomplish and I think you know we're seeing here tonight a, a lot of ways that folks can get involved locally. Um, we're also going to be working with some of our partner organizations on um, specific kind of community engagement activities I think um, it, in order to, to get some of those conversations going, maybe maybe to have conversations within union membership about immigration or to have community-oriented conversations um, w in, in places that might be a little more contentious uh, than, than Northampton. I think that, I, I'm not saying there aren't issues here, there clearly are, but, um, but it's wonderful to have such a supportive crowd come out to see the film. I think in certain other places where we've screened, um, there might be a more, uh, the, the, some of the issues might be even more controversial. And so um, we're working with national partners that have contacts in local areas to, to make sure the film can be a tool for the organizations that are trying to make those conversations happen. Why don't we take a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. Hi, I'm, my name is Michelle and I'm a professor at Hampshire College, so I first really want to thank Jonah for your amazing work that's been very inspirational, I think, also to others, including the faculty at Hampshire, so thank you. Um, and I wanted to ask a question about the, the film, because obviously you were filming this as it was going on, so in some ways you were in a parallel position to both the workers and the, and the organizers and not knowing exactly how things would turn out. And so I wonder what that process was like, you know, now we see it at the end and it has like a story arc and it's very inspiring, but what was it like, how did you get involved and, and, how, and were there moments where you had doubt or didn't know if you would continue or was there a moment when you're like, well, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we were here so early on because, you know, look, look what's happening. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, we, we joined up with this story actually quite a bit after it sort of begins in the movie. Um, we, we were connected to Occupy Wall Street and we found out about this through Occupy Wall Street um, but at the time that we became involved and got permission to start shooting, they were just about to do their union election. So that was kind of where we entered. And the stuff before that is kind of recreated through interviews and archival footage that some of uh, that, like Rogelio had shot. Um, so we were learning a lot as we went about the labor movement and about these kinds of campaigns, about worker centers. And we, we were told by the people involved that it would take possibly three years before any kind of resolution would come about. And we were ready to just stick it out and see what happened. I mean, we were doing freelance jobs on the side, and we, we weren't devoting all our time to it, but we were, we were engaged. Um, 
And then everything just started going crazy and it was moving so fast and so um, kind of stunningly dramatic and fast that we knew we just had to follow every twist and turn and we would, it was, it was, a, it was a very like, <laughs> I mean, we, our experience kind of mirrored that of the workers though with lower stakes, you know. But um, at times we didn't think that it was gonna work out and certainly when like the, the shop was closing, times like that, we, we had less faith than the workers. I think is the best way to put it. I mean, we'd be like, this is, this is going to be the most depressing movie ever. It's a huge tragedy. And, um, and they, were, they were more positive because they, I think they had, um, they had taken such a risk to start this thing that they knew they were forever changed no matter what happened. And watching them and watching that courage that they had about it was what encouraged us to keep going and to not give up our hope. And, um, and that's why we stuck it out to the end. And then, of course, we were blessed with like the most perfect Hollywood ending imaginable. So, <laughs> we're very lucky. Okay. Um, I do just want to interject one thing about future showings of the movie. So just to clarify, to the ticket sales today, there's being split between the Worker Center and Jubilee Films so that they can continue to show it in other locations. And we had them come to Hampshire College, and they were able to get some um, compensation for that, which allows them to do other community film showings at a lower cost. So if, for those of you that are connected to universities or other organizations that might be able to have some money to show it in those locations, make sure to get in touch with them so that th that can help them to do more showings in the future. Sure. Um, one, one little thing about the film um, before this wraps up that's important to me is um, a lot of times people see the credits and they come up to me afterward and they congratulate me for um, doing the score because uh, the name that flashes by looks very similar to my name but it's actually my brother Ryan Blotnick who did the, the incredible score on this film and he's in the audience tonight so I just want to give him giving the credit in two. I think we have a two, is there one more question or two more questions and then we will close out. And those little yellow cards too in your envelopes on the other side, you can give us your information if you want to keep getting updates about the Worker Center and ways that you can get involved and we just usually send like one email a month. Um, this is this is not so much a question as a thank you. <laughs> um, I just I want to thank all of you for all of your work. This this film is about a lot of things. It's not just about workers' rights, and I think that's what is so beautiful about it is that it's a personal story. You know, Mahoma trans transforms, and and in that transformation, we see this hope for a society that maybe could also transform. And I love the fact that Occupy was involved. It's really important that the voice of the Occupy movement continue and continue because that's also a, a story of empowerment. You know, this is all like everybody is worth, is, has worth. And when we forget that, when we forget our human value, it all goes down the toilet, you know, and then it's like there's a 1%, there's a 99%. It's ridiculous. It's not, we're all 100%. Every single human being is 100%. And, and so I love how this um, film mirrors that, and I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank, um, I want to, I, I get really encouraged seeing young activism. It makes me really hopeful for the future. And my, my, my son is also an artist and an activist, and I just, I just see your, like all my sons and all my daughters, and I, and I just, I, I really appreciate it. Not that I don't appreciate older activists, <laughs> as, as I am. I just, I just need, I, you know, I just wanted to like put that out. And, and the other thing is, to be in the valley that I've been living in for so long, and I'm a Latina, um, to be here and to hear, English and Spanish spoken, you know, and it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. This whole experience has just been so um, fulfilling and enriching. So thank you so much for making it happen. Um, my, my question is kind of similar. I was just thinking about how this movie, um, started out as being about Occupy Wall Street, and then it became um, focused on this really interesting 
story that had something to do with Occupy Wall Street. But, I mean, I think something that's amazing about the movie is that it shows what was actually happening at Occupy Wall Street, which probably a lot of people in Northampton didn't really get a very accurate sense from the media of what was actually going on in New York down uh, during that struggle. Um, so I would just like to hear a little more about what it was like during Occupy Wall Street in New York, what actually happened, and what's going on now, what's the future of Occupy Wall Street, what's the next thing? Sure, that's a great question. All right. Um, I think Occupy Wall Street, uh, for those of you, uh, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what that is. Um, there was this amazing moment in which like Occupy Wall Street really captured a national political discourse in the United States. And those moments are really few and far between where um, a national populace actually gets to express how they feel about the political situation. And that is really what is what democracy is all about. Right, but the, the rhetoric between it is, is only so deep, right? Rhetoric is not actually political practice. You actually have to have a strategy to win. And I think that that's what the Laundry Workers Center brings and new creative visions like the Pioneer Valley Workers Center, new creative approaches to these questions that we've been asking for so long, for generations, right? Of like, how do we actually create a situation in which we're all equal, right? Because even though we know that, people live underneath different conditions. And so you see those different conditions playing out in New York City, but also in Northampton, Massachusetts, right? So the same working conditions that exist for these workers here exist right around the corner. So the question that we're asking is how do we create a situation in which people have the same life opportunities? And I think that that's what the Laundry Worker Center and once again, Pioneer Valley Worker Center, who I'd strongly encourage you all to sign up on that card, throw them some cash, um, is that they're actually asking these questions in a way that, that propose new solutions. And I think that that's the thing that Occupy Wall Street really had this moment where it transitioned from a debate or a conversation about inequality into proposed solutions and actions that real people could take, like everyday working people, you know, and also activists and academics and all these people who have these frameworks, we don't always know what to do once we understand the problem, right? And that's what the, the video for me is really about, is like, we can actually envision a world that's different and actually make it happen. Yeah, I would just add to that that um, I, I think for us what was really powerful about this story um, at the moment that we started filming it and um, the reason that I started going to the immigrant worker justice group meetings in the first place was because it, um, you know, the movement was kind of in a moment of transition at that time, the period of maximum uh, media exposure was over after the park had been evicted. But, um, but there were still these networks of people that were really interested in doing things. And the Immigrant Worker Justice Group was made up of a lot of or different organizers, including Michael and Rose, um, who had experience organizing, but had come together to uh, sort of almost, it seemed to be an incubator sort of uh, workshop to provide support for one another's struggles and, and this struggle with the Laundry Worker Center was one that was particularly exciting that happened at that time. And so you had um, you had people who had been occupying in the park, like Diego and Phil, some of the activists uh, you see in the film, um, and, and their kind of energy of direct action combining with really innovative models of worker organizing and attention and, and really attention to the very specific concrete demands and goals of a specific community and i think that was what was really powerful for us at that time was to see this like huge idealistic movement that is about economic inequality in the united states right that it's enormous really coming down to earth and connecting to a very specific local struggle that it was possible to win. And I think the most powerful things that have happened with Occupy, uh, with the, the remaining tendrils of the Occupy network since then have, have followed a similar model, such as Occupy Sandy, 
where um, groups got involved in, in a very local uh, situation. There's also groups in Detroit that are working with the, uh, the water situation there. So uh, that's something you don't hear about it that much in the news anymore, but those networks are still active and, and where they are supporting local communities in those struggles, I think is where the, I think that's where the future of that movement is personally. I'll just add one quick thing to that too. I mean, I think it's been amazing for me to see the, the folks that I've built relationships with when I was in Occupy Wall Street creating new organizations together. Um, I mean, I know personally myself, there's probably 10 organizations that I see being created all across the country with folks that built relationships together like during the Occupy movement in the park. And so, you know, it's a great way to end on that positive note that there's really innovative and amazing organizing going on across the country that came from Zakati Park and has spread all over and um, thanks again to our panelists and to those in the audience and um, uh, sure yeah go ahead one more time I think I forgot we are we are also uh, selling posters uh, to to benefit the we will also divide the proceeds with the worker center so if anyone wants uh, uh, one of our, our lovely posters you can speak to us outside afterwards and just come speak to us anyway because we like to continue the talk so bye. <laughs>